Good afternoon and welcome to the next lecture on algorithms and data structures. Today we will finish lists and uh, in our last lecture we continued with lists. Concretely we discussed stacks and first of all abstract data types. We saw how we can implement a stack. We looked at queues and we saw that well popping at the left end meaning deck queuing is tricky. So we saw a way how we can implement a queue efficiently by using the circular array approach. We discussed the complexity of that applications. We also then looked at linked lists, which are a completely different approach to building lists. And today we will uh, complete linked lists and compare them to array-based lists and uh, then we're done with lists and we can look into recursion. So we looked at lists. We saw uh, eventually we have objects of, of a node class and we connect these nodes to these node objects together. And in the simplest case, we have a singly linked list that one element refers to the next element. Um, we have a pointer or reference to the head and we amended this concept a little bit to build a stack rather than a list, uh, but in a linked way. And we've implemented this and now there are um, I was told by some students that you don't hear me which is strange because it works for me. We can uh, maybe double check who can hear me Yes, I can hear clearly. Okay, good. Because two people reported they couldn't hear me, but now multiple people said they can hear me. Okay, perfect. Um, so the two who it doesn't work may have some strange local issue. Thank you for verifying this. Uh, we have, we can use all sorts of variations of linked lists. Um, rather than just a singly linked list, we can also build a circular linked list, which means the last element um, has a next element, which refers to the head again. We have our head and tail references. And essentially we just say, well, um, like this, we could have a current element or a current reference. And uh, with this current reference, we can always look at the current one, then at the next one, and we can go through this. And once we're at the end, the next element that is current will be the head again. Uh, that's a circular linked list. And you're probably wondering what is that useful for? Uh, for example, it could be used for scheduling. So in, uh, in scheduling in an operating system, uh, this could be implemented as, uh, as a queue or we use simply such a linked circular list. Um, and we use the round, uh, round robin scheduling, meaning we go through um, the tasks or threats and each of them we give some time, then we go to the next one and so forth. So such a um, circular linked list could be used to represent, for example, a queue for scheduling if we wish. Something that you may see also for other use cases. And you could be thinking about if I give you a linked list structure um, and uh, you have to write an algorithm to check whether there is a loop in it or not. So a regular linked list doesn't have a loop, but if we have a circular linked list, we have a loop. Obviously there are many other ways how we could build a loop. Maybe um, maybe we could say that the list is now maybe not a list anymore, but a more complex structure that one node could have multiple successors. And then these successors, they link somewhere in you could think about an algorithm to find whether there is a loop or not in such a structure. It's not in the coursework, but maybe just something to challenge you to think about that uh, you can try out on your own. In addition to the singly linked lists that are linked in one direction, there are also doubly linked lists. And in doubly linked lists, uh, we have our head and our trailer um, tail and we refer from a node like JFK to the next node and from the next node to the following node. But 
we not just forward reference, but also reference uh, in the opposite direction so that a node can uh, refer also to its predecessor or previous node. Such a doubly linked list, first of all, needs more memory because in a node you need to store two references. So it's extra memory usage, but it gives you the advantage that you can go through also from the end to the front. Sometimes that's maybe necessary that you're not always starting at the front and you go through the list. Maybe it's a sort of sorted list and you want to do something with the last few elements. Then, well, you're going to the tail and then from the tail node, you're going to its predecessors and that one's predecessor and so forth. Implementing these doubly linked lists is not that difficult. The only thing you need to pay attention to is that you update both references. So if we have a doubly linked list like this, we have a header and the hat and the tail, and uh, we are adding an element. So we're adding an element to the front. We need to update multiple references. So we create our new front element, which is called here uh, PVD. Probably this refers to airports anyway. And then that one's next is the previous front element. So where header referred to before, um, then you update the previous header. So BWI previous reference to the new one, and you link the header to the new one and the, the new elements predecessor is the header. So you just need to update multiple references, not just one. Uh, cause you have for each node, a, a next and a previous reference and the same, uh, you could think about if, if you insert somewhere in between, you just need to update these references. Same for removing. If you remove an element, uh, you need to update for the element before and after the references, but it isn't that difficult. There's not much coursework about doubly linked lists, but think about it, how you can extend your previous scheme. And it isn't that difficult if you look at the code where you said a node has a next reference or a next element. You can also add a previous element. So you have one more element in here. Um, and when you have, for example, your linked stack, you could try to amend this and you can have the nodes referring in both directions. Whether this makes sense for a stack, maybe it's not the case, but you could implement a linked queue or something and uh, try to add the references to the next and previous elements. So uh, these are doubly linked lists. And now I want to compare a little bit these two approaches to building a list with you. In most of this chapter, we have looked at array-based lists. Then we have investigated link-based lists and we can wonder what are their pros and cons and which one is better. Turns out none of them is better than the other, but both have their pros and cons. And depending on your use case and what you want to do, you need to pick one of them. So if we look at these array-based sequences or just array-based lists, they have one great advantage. And the advantage is you are you can access every element in O of one because you put it in your RAM and you can just access that memory address of index 500, for example. With a link-based list, you cannot do that because with a link-based list, you can refer to the front and the tail, but if you want to go to element, say, 500, and you have 10,000 elements in it, um, you would just go to the front element and then you move forward until you arrive at element 500. So that is quite inefficient. While the lookup can be done super efficiently and just not just lookup, also overriding or setting the item uh, in O of one with an array-based sequence. What I also notice is the array-based sequences, they typically need less memory than linked structures because for the linked structures, we need uh, to have these node objects and we have references to the next element or even on top to the previous element. All of this needs memory, but if we just use an array-based sequence, it's one block in our RAM and we don't need all these extra references for each element. So overall, this needs proportionally less memory than linked structures. And 
if you have two, if you have an operation to compare linked lists and array based lists, and you have two operations that have the same complexity. Uh, so for example, operation X, which you can do on an array based sequence or a linked base sequence, and they have the same complexity, typically the array-based one runs a little bit faster with a certain constant factor, still in the same order because it's the same complexity, but typically you would notice with an array-based structure that this runs somewhat faster, uh, at least with a constant factor than with a linked-based structure. And that's also the reason why probably for most use cases, if you compare all use cases of lists, probably there is a strong maturity for the array-based ones, not for the link-based ones. Nonetheless, the link-based ones have some advantages that I want to discuss with you. And then depending on your use case and what you want to do exactly, uh, you can pick that one. The advantage of link-based structures is that you can very easily do insertions and deletion deletions without copying all around, because that's what we have to do if we insert or delete somewhere in between. With an array-based one, we need to create a new array and copy. This is something we don't need to do with the array-based, uh, with the link-based structures. However, we first need to make it to that element. And if the element is somewhere in between, I first need to walk there, which also takes time. Uh, probably, one other advantage is you don't need to reserve a lot of space in advance. With an array-based sequence, you need to reserve a lot of space in advance and then grow um, and resize. This is something you don't need to do with the link-based structure because you're just creating on the fly new nodes and you connect them. And um, this is probably their difference or the most important differences. Uh, then we can also, so I said, in practice, probably the array-based sequences are more common. It also has to do with the impact of caching in your operating system. And um, one advantage that I just missed, it's also mentioned here in link-based sequences, is they provide worst-case time bounds for the operations which are more precise because with these uh, array-based structures, we often use amortized bounds, um, which have advantages, but also disadvantages because the worst case may happen at some point for resizing. And uh, resizing is not an issue in your link-based sequences. But still in practice, the array-based ones are the ones that are most common. Also caching in an operating system Will, will definitely help you to speed up the array-based ones and the other ones that are most common. But depending on your use case, there are reasonable use cases for using a link-based structure. So um, probably most of the time you'll pick an array-based structure, but sometimes you may have to pick a link-based one. And that's why it's important that we discussed uh, those two differences and how to implement both of them. So, so what we have done so far in this course in the last five weeks or so is we started with graphs, a highly generic data structure. Lists are a variation thereof. We've seen operations in lists, how to append to a list. And there are more operations for lists in the coursework. Uh, so today there were quite some students in the lab. Take a look at all these problems. For example, how to implement set item, insert, remove. I've discussed this today with some students in the lab, plus all these other problems. Because there are also some assignments on stacks or on, uh, linked lists and so forth. Take a look at that. It will certainly give you extra exposure. We have the tool at hand to discuss uh, the complexity. It's our O analysis. We've also seen a couple of other notations omega, theta, and then with lists, when we have these dynamic data structures, we've also looked at amortization. And later in this course, we will still look at trees, maps, and hash tables, and other data structures. But in order to work on some of these data structures, in particularly trees, we need a tool that is called recursion. And recursion can also be very helpful for doing sorting. 
We will uh, motivate recursion by looking at search, sequential search, and then we look at an algorithm design concept that we call divide and conquer. It's a very uh, famous uh, design pattern for algorithms. And when we and we use recursion to implement this, and uh, recursion allows us that a function calls itself. You'll see that this is super helpful for uh, various algorithm problems. Then we also want to understand the complexity of uh, recursive algorithms. And for that, we need some new tools because looking at recursive algorithms is more tricky when we want to determine their complexity. So we will look at so-called recurrence relations, which uh, describe the behavior of a recursive or the, first of all, recurrence relations are a very generic concept from maths. We will use it here to describe the behavior of a recursive algorithm, and then we can solve it to find its complexity. This one is a lot of manual work. So for a certain class, of uh, recursive algorithms, we can use the master theorem, which allows us to determine this complexity far easier. And then we look a little bit at backtracking and dynamic programming, which are two approaches that are uh, very helpful when it comes to recursion. So, um, so far, when you wanted to do repetition in your algorithms, you did not just copy and paste the same line over and over. Rather, you used loops like while or for, or a do while in other languages. And recursion is just a completely different approach to achieve repetition by saying a function makes one or more calls to itself. And we can start with a motivation. Um, so this is a second semester course. Uh, who of you has implemented some recursive functions already? Maybe in your programming one course in your first semester, maybe thumbs up. If you have not been exposed to recursion, maybe a thumbs down. But will be a quick revision what we are doing now. There are also some students who have not done this yet, so that's fine. Uh, we're starting from scratch, and once we have established some easy examples, we'll dive deeper. For example, we have the factorial function, like six factorial. You can um, you have a description here of how to compute a factorial, and if you say the factorial of zero, that's one, and if you have the factorial of, for example, three. The factorial is three times two times one. You have the factorial of six. This would be six times five times four times three times two times one. And we will now try to implement this concept purely with a loop. We will later come to recursion. And for this, I have my coding session here. And uh, we can say, well, we can say this is factorial iterative for n. And I'm just implementing what we had done so far. We say we have a result one and return the result. And now we need to look into the case where um, the input n is greater than one. So what I can do most easy is I have a loop that considers the range from one to n plus one. This time we put in n plus one because we want n included. If, we, if I just wrote n, then n would not be included. But if I say it's the factorial of six, I want six times something, not just five times something. So here in this range, I put from one up to n plus one. One is the lower boundary because I don't want this for a zero because otherwise uh, it won't work out. And because uh, then I would, multiply a zero into the product and the whole product would be zero. And this is what I'm doing. I'm going uh, from one to n plus one and I multiply the result with i. So times one times two times three times four up to n plus one where n plus one is excluded. And I can try this out. I can say factorial iterative of three. It's three times two times one six 
factorial of 6 is 720, and the factorial of 10 is 3,628,800. So fairly easy if you know loops, and we will now go back to our slides, and we will try to re-express this. So we had defined the factorial function like this, and we can actually redefine it in a recursive manner. Because we can say, well, n factorial is just one where n is zero. But we can also now say, well, actually, as a reference to itself, the n factorial is n times the factorial of n minus one. So I'm just reducing n by one. And this is the recursive definition. And then n minus one factorial would be n minus one times the factorial of n minus two. And I keep doing this for n that is greater than or equal to one. So it's a recursive definition. The function is defined in terms of itself. And we can also try to implement this. We can say uh, this is now factorial recursive for n. And we care about the edge case and say n is 0, so I'm returning 1. Otherwise, I'm returning n times the factorial recursive of n minus 1. So I'm just implementing the function I had written down in the slides, where n is 0, I return 1. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's n times factorial recursive of n minus 1. I assume I only put in here values 0 and greater, uh, not negative values, then this will not work. Uh, so, But I'm not putting in any checks now to raise an exception because uh, we had defined the function before for n's that are 0 or greater than or equal to 1. So uh, this will not perform as expected if I put in negative values. But uh, this is an algorithms and data structures course, not a programming course, where I may uh, put in, uh, where I may define a contract of an interface and then put in all these checks, because uh, this would be most of the code then. Uh, and we can compare the results for this and say factor factorial recursive for three is six, uh, for six it's 720, and for 10 it's the same result as before. And we can um, later, or later we will worry about running time and all of this and memory usage, but for now we're just implementing these functions and later we will investigate deeper uh, which one is actually maybe faster than the other one but uh, I think later is a good time to try this out. Uh, for now we are trying to visualize what I just implemented and what I have visualized here is called a recursion trace for the call factorial of five. And what I see here, if I call this for five, then eventually I will have, um, I see the lower part of this uh, trace. I don't see the five, it's further up, it's left out. But then for five, it takes five times the factorial of four. The factorial of four is four times the factorial of three and the factorial of three is six. So it, this one returns four times the factorial of three. Factorial of three is another recursive call, which is then to three times of the factorial of two. Factorial of two is two times factorial of one. And then factorial of one is factorial of zero times one, which was one times one is two and so forth. So uh, this so-called recursion trace is just, we see how this, recursion develops and when it finishes and then returns these values and internally in my operating system function calls and therefore also recursion 
are implemented or, or to handle them is implemented with a stack because each time I'm calling a function, I have a new local context, plus I may need to store some local variables, some variables from uh, the CPU, like registers and so forth. So each time I'm doing a function call, I'm actually putting something on top of the stack in the operating system. And once a function call has finished, I will pop it from the stack. So each time I'm actually calling a recursive function, I'm putting something more on the stack. And that's why these two functions we have just implemented, they actually do have a difference in terms of their memory footprint because the, um, the iterative one it just creates the local result variable, maybe some other helper variables, but that's it. And if I use the recursive one, I'm put so the iterative has a memory footprint of O of one because it's constant for the iterative one, because all I'm using is a local variable in the loop. But for the recursive one, I'm putting each time I have a recursive call something on the stack. And that's why the recursive function, it has the same running time complexity, both are O of N, but the memory usage uh, or the memory complexity of the recursive one is O of N because each time I'm putting something on the stack. And when N is large, maybe a very large number, then I'm putting quite a lot on top of the stack. So bear that in mind that uh, when I have recursion, this may have impact on my memory footprint and therefore on my space complexity. Um, space complexity is something we had introduced briefly before and I said later it would be important again and that's the case today. And sometimes this kind of visualization here is also called a, a recursion tree or something because it, it could also branch out. You may have more complex uh, recursive functions that could branch out and then uh, this would be a tree or something. But we'll see such a branching recursion later as well. Then we will now look at a search problem. What I want to do is I have a sequence of values, can be a list or an array, but for now we just say it's a list. And it's not necessarily sorted. This one here, it's two, four, five, seven, eight, nine, twelve, and so forth. It's sorted, but this list does not have to be sorted for now. We assume it may not be sorted. And I want to look for a specific value in here. I want to check, for example, is there a 22 in it? Is there a 31 in it? And it's unsorted. So I start from the left, I check if the first element is the one I'm looking for. If so, I'm returning true. If not, I'm looking at the next one and so forth. Maybe it's the 22, then I can abort here. But if there's a value that I'm looking for that is not in it, I need to go through the whole list. And we can again try to implement this. And what we are implementing is simply called linear or sequential search, where I'm not assuming that this is sorted in any way. So I can say this is linear search. I have my data and the target. The target is the value I'm looking for. I'm going through my data, my current data entry I call val for value. And if value is equal to the target, I return true. If the loop finishes, that means I have not returned true, I still need to return false. And we can try out the linear search and say, well, my data set is a three, a two, a one, a six, a five, and I'm looking for a three, which is just the first element, it returns true. For five, it also returns true, but if I'm looking for a 10, it will return false. What do you think, so this has nothing to do yet with recursion. We will later try to implement this in a more efficient way using recursion. But for this linear search, what do you think is the running time complexity? O of what? Assuming the worst case 
and any suggestions in the chat will be appreciated. And we already got a few answers. It's O of N because we care about the worst case. So yes, we may have to go through the whole list. Maybe we finish earlier, that's a better case, but we assume the worst case. So it's O of N, what you said is correct. So when I ask you for the complexity, always write O of N and not just N, because N could be something, I don't know. It's a complexity, so it's O of N. And now we will make, we'll try to find a more efficient algorithm to do this. We later see how much more efficient it is, but we call it binary search. And binary search makes one assumption. It makes the assumption that my data set is sorted. So that's a requirement. And again, I will look for a target value. And if that's the value, if I find the value in there, I return true. If I don't find it, I return false. Now, when this is sorted, I can actually do a trick. Say, I want to find the value 22. I have two references, low and high. Uh, low is initially referring to the lowest element, to the lowest index, and high to the maximum index. Then I'm checking what's the value of the middle element, so the element just between the lower and the higher end. This would be index uh, 7, for example, the mid element, and it's 14. So I'm checking, is my middle element the element I'm looking for. I'm looking for 22. It's not. But then I know because this is sorted, if there is a 22, it can only be in the right half because it's sorted and the middle is a 14. So if 22 exists, it must be in the right half and not in the left half. So I can ignore the left half. And when I ignore the left half, I'm changing the low index and the low index will be the middle index and one element further to, to the right of the middle. Because the middle is the 14. This is not the one I'm looking for. So I can just move the low index to the element next to the 14, which was the mid element. So low now refers to element 17, which is index 8. High still refers to 37, index 15. Now, again, I can find the middle element, which is index 11, and its value 25. I'm looking at this half, and I found the 25 in the middle. It's not 22, but what I know is, well, the 22 is smaller than 25, so if it exists, it must be in the left half of this remaining interval I'm looking at. So I'm moving high to the mid and one element left to the mid because the middle is already investigated. So I'm moving the high to the 22, which is index 10. Now again, what's the middle element? It's index nine, it's a 19. 19 is smaller than 22. So actually I can only look at this remaining interval it's now only one element left in this interval. So low and high is the same. So the middle element is this one as well. And here I'm checking if it's 20, if this is 22, if that's the case, I'm returning true. And I have found my 22. If this was a different value than, for example, 23, then I would, I would be returning false. And this is called binary search because in each iteration or in each next step, I'm halving the interval. And the interval I'm looking at will shrink extremely quickly by just doing a few steps of that sort. We will now look at how we can implement our binary search. And uh, we can say, well, this is binary search. Again, my data and my target. And I need two more 
parameters, low and high, which is my lower index and my higher index. Um, but I say, well, I don't need to specify them. Uh, if I don't specify them, that means I call search binary on the data with the target. If I don't pass a value for low and high, they will just be none. If that's the case, so I check if low is none, then low will be just the smallest index possible. So I don't need to manually put in zero and whatever, but if low is none, I just pick the smallest index possible. And if high is none, then uh, high is the length of the data minus one. So it's the largest possible index. And we will later um, add something here. So I put XXX, which put this with a, um, with a car as a comment, because we will be doing something. There will be, in fact, some uh, if something, well, I'll write it like this, then something, what we'll investigate this later. Um, but if that is not the case, what we will be seeing soon, then I actually want to do what I had just visualized before. I want to find the middle element because I have my low index and my high index. So the middle element is just the indexes low and high added divided by two. And I want an integer division because what I want here is low and high, they may add up to a value like six, then I'm fine. Then if I divide by two, the middle will be three. But if they add up to seven, I don't want an index that is like three and a half. And if I write these two slashes, then I have an integer division in Python three. If you are from the Java world or Python two world, you would be just using one slash to have an integer division. That's probably what you're used to, but in Python three, uh, if you have a regular slash, it will be um, a floating point division, but we want an integer division. So I need to put these two um, slashes there. And I'm checking now if my target element is actually the middle element. So that's what we did. We said we calculate our mid index. And then we check if the middle index refers to our target. So the data at index middle, if that is the target value, I'm returning true. We will now see this is one case. And now we have two other cases. One case could be the target is less than the middle element. And if that is the case, I can only look at the left half. Because if target is less than the middle, okay, I don't need the right half of the interval anymore. Now I'm doing a recursive call and I'm calling search binary. I'm still passing my data and my target. I'm passing my low value because the low reference or the low index will not change, but I am changing the high index. And we said, if we look at the left interval or the left half, then the high index will be the mid index minus one. Minus one because we don't need to look at the middle element again. And then we have a last case. And the last case is actually that I'm looking into the right half of the interval. So it's return, search binary, data, target, um, the high index, has not changed, but the low index will be now the middle plus one because we're looking at the right half of the interval. And one thing is very important. I'm not just calling the recursive, or I'm not just doing the recursive call, but I need to return this because search binary will return me something, for example, true or something else. And what it returns, I need to return again. So if you don't write a return here, it may do a recursive call and it may return you something, but you need to return this back to the function or uh, the previous uh, search binary 
uh, instance that call it. So always put return this, don't forget the return. Now there's one case left, and this was this if here, because you see we're moving the left or high index. And once we have just a tiny interval left of like one element, for example, and we have not found the target in this middle, but I'm updating the high to mid minus one or the low to mid plus one, then low will actually not be smaller than high anymore, but they have actually changed the order. So if high is greater than, uh, sorry, if low is greater than high, or if high is less than low, then I have not found my result and I'm returning false. Because this case will eventually happen. I'm doing a recursive call with something like this, where I only had one element left and I'm not changing low, but uh, mid minus one will be then to the left of low or here just vice versa. And if that's the case, that the low index is greater than the high index or the high index is less than the low index, uh, then I'm returning false. I have not found my data. We can try this out now. We can say, well, I have my binary search. I say, well, this is a one, three, six, seven, eight, 10, 20. It must be sorted. This is important. And I want to find out if there is a one in it and it returns true. If I put in my three, it returns true. Um, if I put in the 10, it's true, the 20. And there's a question here, if low is equal to high, um, well, the low equal to high, we saw this before, this would be just when we have one element left in that recursive call. And if we have that one element left, low and high are equal. That means mid is also where low and high point to. And this, uh, if this is true, that means the target is that middle element where, and I have low and high and mid are the same element, I'm returning true. If that's not the case, I would either go to here or there depending on the values and then it would happen that low is greater than high. And now I'm putting in some value that doesn't exist like a two and we see it returns a false or a 200, it returns a false and the beauty is with a recursion, we can express a binary search very easily because I'm just saying, well, it's a recursive call and I'm keeping my data in my target. I'm just changing these boundaries of the interval. Obviously, you can implement this algorithm in an iterative variation. This is sometimes something you see in the coursework or in past exams that you have to turn this algorithm into an iterative one. And if, if we are able to express this with a loop, it will have the same running time complexity. But with my binary search, I have a certain extra memory usage that is not constant because I'm calling this binary search recursive call a few times. And that's not constant, so I have a certain space complexity, which one you can think about this um, as a homework. However, if I can express this as with a loop and I do it right, then my memory or my space complexity will be constant. Now that we talked about space complexity because of the recursion, what do you think is the time complexity of binary search? Maybe without looking at the slides, um, all of what is the time complexity of our binary search? If you have any guesses, send this to the chat. And one student suggested it's the binary logarithm of n, which is correct. So log two of n, but log two of n is uh, log n divided by log two and log two is a constant. So we just leave that out. So we just say it's O of log n. Um, maybe it's intuitively clear because each time I'm halving the space. So 
And that's in fact a logarithm time complexity, but we will do a formal analysis later. We will learn a tool in order to investigate the running time complexity, this algorithm. And in fact, um, this is a super good complexity. So even if we have one uh, million elements, the binary logarithm is only about 30. So I'm in the worst case, I only need to have like 30 checks um, or, or um, my, I only have like 30 function calls of binary search in the worst case, in the worst case, but it could be much faster. For example, if I'm just lucky and I find the element quickly, uh, but you see, this is a major improvement compared to my linear search because with linear search, it's O of N. So 1 billion entries. Uh, and for this 1 billion, the log n, uh, log 2n is just about 30. So billion, not million, maybe I said million before by accident, it's billion, obviously. Uh, and that's why the binary search is extremely efficient. But it assumes that my data set is sorted. If it's not sorted, this will not work. How to sort a data set, this is something we will be seeing in the next chapter once we have finished. Uh, recursion. So this is something we'll be discussing in uh, one or two weeks from now. And how we can determine the complexity of this recursive algorithm is also something we'll be seeing. What we have actually just done is an algorithm design pattern that we call divide and conquer. Divide and conquer it means I have a data set or an input that is too big for me to investigate at that moment. And then I will actually divide it into multiple parts. I will work on these multiple parts and try to solve them. So I'm conquering this. So I try to recursively solve those sub problems. And once I have these solutions for the sub problems, I will combine eventually the solutions of the sub problems and merge them into a solution of the original problem. And this is just what our binary search did because we have this big data set. We cannot directly examine whether our uh, target is in it or not, but well, we can break it into smaller data sets and we can do this recursively. And once we have a solution, we, we combine it all together. And that's why we also needed to say, return, this, um, return the result of the recursive call because this will allow us eventually to combine this. Um, maybe sometimes you don't need to divide. If your input size is smaller than a certain threshold, like for example, just a single element uh, in our binary search, yes, then we don't need to do this further. Um, but if it's too big, we will recursive, we will uh, continue dividing. So divide and conquer. And uh, divide and conquer is actually a design pattern we are using not just for binary search, we are also using this uh, for quick sort, for example, merge sort, and other algorithms that we are investigating throughout this course. And I'll now have a little quiz for you that I want to solve with you. It's called the Towers of Hanoi. Who of you has ever seen the Towers of Hanoi? Um, it's something I saw when I was in high school. Uh, it was discussed in my computer science class in high school, but I had already seen this years before in an algorithms book. If you have never seen the Towers of Hanoi, maybe thumbs down, it's totally fine if you have never seen this. And I'm sure there, there's someone who has not seen it. I only get um, so far, yeah, now we got the first result that someone has not seen it. And that's absolutely fine. We'll be discussing it. So in the towers of Hanoi, we have a platform and we have three of these sticks. And we have these disks, so we can call these sticks A, B, and C. Um, and we have now st uh, a stack of disks, of n many disks on one of these sticks, for example here. And we have a rule that the largest one of these disks is at the bottom and we are only allowed to put smaller disks on top. So always a disk under a disk must be bigger or 
taller or larger, and we are only allowed to put smaller disks on the stick. This applies to this stick, but also to all the other sticks. So that's a rule for every stick. And now I want to move everything from the first stick to the last stick. So I want to move this whole um, stack of disks from the first to the last stick. And I can use the intermediary auxiliary stick as a helper, but for whatever moving I'm doing, I'm only allowed to put smaller uh, disks on top of larger disks. So I'm not allowed to just mix disks and have a, have a small disk at the bottom and then a big one on top, that's forbidden. Because otherwise it would be fairly easy to solve this. Um, so I'm not allowed to change these conditions or the conditions always larger disks under smaller disks. And I want to move everything from stick A to stick C and I can use the intermediary stick. This looks very complex and it appears that you may need a lot of code to do that. But the beauty is if you use recursion, it's actually fairly doable. We'll see this now. Um, your task could be come up with an iterative algorithm to do this, and you will see that your iterative algorithm will be fairly complex. It can be done, but we don't want to be doing this. But we will be investigating this from a recursive perspective and actually apply divide and conquer. Because we can say, well, I can move my whole stack except the bottom one. And later, the bottom one. But I'll show you now how to do this. And with divide and conquer, this is, in fact, fairly easy. We can say this is the towers of Hanoi for n many, and we will have a source, a target, and an auxiliary stack. Uh, we need to give them names, so I'm using strings in this implementation. So the source is A, the target is C, and the auxiliary is B. And someone sent a link here in the chat to play this game online, probably just on your own, and you need to find an efficient solution of how to play this. But we will now, so the minimum number of movements to play this in a user interface, but uh, we will now um, actually implement it, but feel free to play this game that someone's shared here in the chat. And you'll see maybe for n equals three, this is quite easy, but if you say n equals 10, it will probably take quite some time to play this. Uh, we will have a special case if n is just one, then it will be actually fairly easy. We can say move disk one from, and I'm putting here these variables, and uh, this syntax actually means I have one variable and another one, and with formatting the string, I'm passing the concrete values I want to put in there. So I'm building a string and it says, move disk one from source to target, where source and target are A and C, but you can customize them. So uh, this is what this formatting means, and then we're done. So this is the easiest case. I just have one step, um, I just have one disk. So I just move that disk from zero to one and I'm done. Uh, or from not zero to one, from A to C and I'm done. Now it will become, we will actually only need three more lines to solve the towers of Hanoi. We will now implement this with divide and conquer, because what I can do is I can say, well, I'll take now n minus one disks, so all the disks except the bottom disk, and I move this stack from source to auxiliary. So from source to auxiliary, 
because this parameter is the source, this is the target, and this is the auxiliary one. So I'm using from source to auxiliary, and target is my helper I can use. Then I'm printing something that I will just copy and paste. We now move a disk, and this is another parameter. So I'm moving a disk with a certain number, and this number is n, because n is the top uh, um, or the, our value, the number of uh, disks we have. And we want to move this from source to target. So I'm moving the whole stack except the bottom one. So all the other disks except the bottom one. I move all the disks from source to auxiliary. Target can be a helper. And then I'm using the biggest disk at the bottom and I move this from source to target. Now I still have all the other ones in the stack in my auxiliary one. And what I can do is, well, I can just now move all these n minus ones from the auxiliary, so the helper one, to the target and source can be used as a helper. And I have just implemented the Towers of Hanoi. We can try this for a single disk. I just move my disk from A to C. If I have two disks, I move my first disk from A to B, the helper, then the big disk at the bottom from A to C, so from the source to the target, and then the smaller disk from the auxiliary again on top of the target. If I put this um, a, a stack of three, this is in fact seven disks, so the minimum solution. And if you have, I don't know, like five disks, we will already see this takes quite a bit. And if I put in 10 disks, you will see this actually takes a lot of steps to do. We have received this link here in, in the chat where you can play this game online and you can try to find the minimum solutions or you let the computer solve this for you. And we have just solved the Towers of Hanoi fairly easy by using the concept of divide and conquer because I'm dividing the problem. I'm moving the whole tower except the bottom one. And in order to do this, I again need recursion and I increasingly make this tower smaller. And once I only have one disk left, I move that and then the rest of the tower. So this is recursion. Um, if you wanna get a better understanding of recursion, there's something I can also recommend to you. You can use, uh, for example, um, a debugger to understand recursion a bit better or maybe put in some prints or something. Prints are not great, but can help you to understand when a function is called and when it's closed. Uh, this may help you a little bit if you put uh, maybe a print at the bottom, at the top at the bottom, or use a debugger. All of this can help you. And maybe you can try to visualize uh, such a stack, uh, uh, such a tree of, um, of the Towers of Hanoi or the stack trace. Try to visualize this on a piece of paper and see how it develops uh, based on uh, the Towers of Hanoi. You may wonder what the complexity of all of this is. And it turns out the complexity of the, the running time complexity of the Towers of Hanoi is O of 2 to the n. So it's exponential, something you may have also guessed if you looked at how quickly the number of movements uh, develops when you just put n to 5 or 10. Again, why this is exponential is something we will see later when we do a formal analysis. Now I want to compare with you recursion and uh, iterative approaches. Recursions or recursion has some pros. It definitely leads to cleaner code. You don't need loops in this. You don't need these helper variables in a loop. So it leads to cleaner code. 
And probably for certain problems, it's more intuitive to think in a recursive way and it's more natural to solve the problem like this. Recursion is used also a lot for, for example, for traversing trees. In a few weeks, we'll be discussing trees and how to traverse them. Recursion is a very intuitive way how you can tra uh, traverse a tree. But recursion also has some downsides. For example, it uses more memory because of your stack, because each time you're doing a recursion call, you put something stack. I've explained this before. So recursion needs more memory and recursion can also tend to be extremely slow if not implemented correctly. Uh, not for such a linear recursion like calculating the factorial, but some branching recursion, for example, a binary recursion, or multiple recursion. We'll see an example very soon. If that is not implemented correctly, recursion tends to become extremely slow. If you have too many function calls, this can lead to a stack overflow because you're just running out of stack in your operating systems. And sometimes you may feel that debugging recursion can be more tough to debug than if you have a big loop that you're debugging. So there are some pros and cons. Depending on your problem, recursion can be very helpful, but it can lead to downsides. And I will show you now an example of the running time of all of this. I'm resharing my coding environment now with you. What I want to implement with you are the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers or the Fibonacci number is the sum of its two previous Fibonacci numbers. So we can say fib, and we can say, well, we return that the Fibonacci number of n is the Fibonacci number of n minus 1 and the Fibonacci number of n minus 2. So for example, the Fibonacci number of 5 is the Fibonacci number of 4 and 3. We can easily describe this in a recursive way. Don't forget the return, otherwise it will not work because I'm returning what this sum returns and or what this sum is. But I have a branching recursion because this eventually calls fib of n for or fib of n minus one, which is then fib of n minus two and fib of n minus three. And so this leads to a huge tree and this one as well. And you probably wonder what are the corner cases. In fact, this needs to also terminate at some point. So for n, the Fibonacci number is 0. For n equals 1, the Fibonacci number is 1. We could leave it like this, but in the slides, I wrote it out like this. So these are the Fibonacci numbers. We can test this, for example, the Fibonacci number of five is Fibonacci number of 10 is 55. Just checking if uh, this is implemented correctly, but should be that it's 55. Yeah. And the Fibonacci number of uh, one is our one. Uh, Fibonacci number of uh, two is also one because the Fibonacci number of two is the Fibonacci number of one and the Fibonacci number of zero. Zero Fibonacci number of zero is zero and the Fibonacci number of one is one. Now, if you put in like, for example, 15, you will see that this keeps growing very rapidly. And we can now wonder how long does it take to run this? We're not caring about complexity right now. I'm caring about running time. And when we motivated our complexity analysis, we saw how we can measure running time because we measure the time, then we run something and we measure the time again. It's a few lines of code and it turns out in IPython, but you can also do this 
in your Jupyter notebooks, you can do something like this. You can say um, percentage time. And what the interactive environment gives you is it measures how long this takes to run. And it gives you the running time. And we see this takes like 317 milliseconds. You can also try a time it and the time it just runs this multiple times and it tries to give you some average plus some standard deviation. So if you say time it, this is run multiple times, concretely seven runs. And we see an average this takes 328 milliseconds plus or minus a standard deviation of 16.8 milliseconds. But for now, we just do time. So we see this takes 312 milliseconds. And if I put in 32, we already see it takes 834 milliseconds. If I put in 34, we already take maybe like two seconds. Now, if I want that Fibonacci number of a very large number, you will see that this does not scale. It has to do with this multiple recursion because if you visualize the recursion tree, you're just computing the same results over and over again because uh, say FIP of 10 would be FIP of nine and FIP of eight. But FIP of nine is FIP of eight and FIP of seven. So you're just recalculating the same stuff over and over again in such, um, such a binary recursion. Because FIP of eight is again FIP of seven and FIP of six. FIP of seven is FIP of six and five and so forth. So you just have a lot of duplicates in this huge tree and you're just recomputing this over and over again. And that is certainly inefficient. And there are some ways to address this issue for example, by doing something that we call memorizing. In Python, there is the function tools package. It allows you to deal with functions. And what we have in there is an LRU cache. Um, and for now, it's just a cache. And the cache allows us to store the result of a function for a certain input. So again, I can just copy paste my, my Fibonacci function, but now we call it say Fib2. And I'm adding something on top. And what I'm adding on top, I'll write out first, then I'll explain you what it is. I say an at LRU cache and I call it. With this at notation, you're doing something in Py or using something in Python that we call a decorator. And the decorator will eventually be what we are referring to or what we are calling when we call FIP2. But this decorator is something around FIP2. So from now on, when I call outside FIP2, I'm not calling this function directly, rather I'm calling this decorator. And the decorator does something. There are lots of different decorators in Python. We will see some decorators again uh, in a couple of weeks, but the LRU cache does something that we call memorizing. And memorizing means when this function is called for a certain n, it first checks if this function was ever called with this n before, and if so, it will just return the result that was previously computed. So this cache stores internally um, the results for given ends for which this function has been called before. Just in order to make sure that this, ca that this cache doesn't use up all your memory, if you call it on too many different things, it's an LRU cache and it just at some point will eliminate things from the cache when it gets too big, but that detail doesn't matter for us. And uh, feel free to look up how the LRU cache works, or just trust me that it stores internally the result for a given n on which I have computed before. And then if that's the case, if it stores this it's in, in its memory, it's just returning the result and it's not recomputing it. Because in the original implementation, I'm recomputing each time I'm calling this for an n, I'm recomputing. 
And if n is large, there are so many duplicates in here that I'm computing. But what the LRU cache does is once it's computed for a certain result, for example, 0, 1, 2, 3, eventually these results are stored up to 20, 50, whatever. And it allows you that you don't have to recompute all these duplicates. And once your call is finished and you call it again on that value, it will still be um, stored for you as long as the program is open or as long as you're not eliminating the cache. So we saw before for FIP, this took like 312 milliseconds. And if we do this for FIP2, we will see it only takes 24 microseconds. And now this allows me that I can use even very large values like 500. And for 500, it takes uh, just 822, 827 microseconds. While if I call the regular FIP on 500, this will not finish in your lifetime. So memorizing is something extremely helpful. And when you build recursive algorithms, consider whether you need um, whether you need memorizing. For some use cases, it doesn't make sense, while for others it makes a case, especially where maybe the input output or you put in the input and the output is deterministic and it won't change anytime soon. Or maybe if the background variables change, you have to refresh the cache. Things like this need to be considered, but it can lead to massive speed up. And like this, we can still solve the Fibonacci numbers extremely easily just using recursion, but we add memorizing on top. Has any of you ever used memorizing before? Maybe thumbs up, thumbs down, if this is something you have seen before or not. When we, uh, when we are at the end of this chapter in the next lecture, we'll look into a concept of dynamic programming. And there uh, we will look at multiple techniques, how to speed up recursion and there we will also implement our own memoizer because right now we're just using the LRU cache from the function tools package in Python. But at the end of the next lecture, you will see how you can implement such a memoizer on your own, if you wish, at least a very simple one. This one here is highly generic for functions with multiple inputs and so forth and different types that you can put in. Uh, we're not building it on our own to that a level of generalization, but uh, we're just using this professional one. But in a few, in the next lecture, you'll see how to build this on your own. Now, um, there is some best practices that you should bear in mind. Um, if you can use such memorizing, this is great. There is also a certain kind of recursion that we call tail recursion. And tail recursion means that the very last operation in your function is a recursive call. And it turns out that such tail recursions, if you ever see them, they can be eliminated very, very easily just with a loop. And uh, these tail recursions are only uh, linear recursions. And if you have them, you can eliminate them super easily. But if we look at our algorithms from before, algorithm 38 has a tail recursion. This is a tail recursion and this can be rewritten in, a loop, in terms of a loop super easily. But we've seen other algorithms like algorithm 36, uh, this factorial implementation, uh, this is not a tail recursion because we have the recursive call, but we are not returning it. We are returning a product of something and a recursive call. So this is not a tail recursion. However, this kind of uh, this algorithm can easily be rewritten with a loop. But when it gets more complex, this would be more difficult. But if you have a pure tail recursion, so your last operation is just a return of the recursive call. Such tail recursions can often be, or in most cases, be rewritten super easily. And you should do so because it will make 
your running time and your stack trace much easier. Um, now if you're wondering, can all of our recursive functions be converted to loops? Because we've seen pros and cons. Uh, in, in fact, yes. All our loops, uh, all of our uh, recursive calls can be converted to loops and all of our loops can be converted to recursive calls. They are equally powerful, uh, which is um, in theory at least. In practice, however, it can be fairly difficult if you have a very complex uh, recursive algorithm and you want to convert it into a non-recursive non one, like for example, already our Towers of Hanoi, it isn't always that trivial to do that conversion. Um, and what you often need to do is if you eliminate your recursion, you somehow need to emulate the stack because when you use recursion, the operating system has a stack for you, which makes your life very easy. And when you do loops instead of recursion, often you need to manually emulate that stack. And depending on what kind of recursion it is, if it's like a binary or multiple recursion, that isn't that easy. So I'm not against recursion. Recursion is very helpful because for divide and conquer, it can be very intuitive, it can make your life easy. It can lead to performance issue. You've seen some tools or some approaches of how to make them more efficient. If it's tail recursion, yes, probably you can convert it quite easy. For other algorithms can be more difficult. Uh, but later at the end of this course, we'll look a little bit into dynamic programming and some best practices of how we can convert such a recursive function into a different one. Uh, and then maybe these are some of the, the sign patterns you can reuse in the future in order to convert some recursions to loops. But we'll keep also some recursions because uh, for certain problems in this course, recursions are in fact very helpful. Now we still got 15 minutes. So I want to do the last section with you for today. You have learned in detail in this course how to determine the running time complexity of an iterative algorithm. Because we look at the loop and we've seen lots of examples of how to determine the running time complexity. Now, when it comes to our recursive algorithms, this is in fact more difficult. And I will show you one approach that allows you to determine the running time complexity of recursive algorithms. Concretely, we're using recurrence relations. Uh, recurrence relations, first of all, have nothing to do with our O complexity. Recurrence relations are a very generic concept from maths. And effectively, a recurrence relation is an equation that expresses each element of a sequence as a function of the proceedings. And we will now use or introduce recurrence relations and use this concept in order to determine the running time complexity of an algorithm. And the algorithm we'll be looking at is our binary search. And before we said that binary search has a running time complexity of O of log N. And we said we will show this in a formal analysis and that's what we are doing now. So recurrence relations, for binary search. And again, this derivation is also formatted very well in the slides uh, and uh, far nicer than my handwriting. What we've said is in our binary search, we said if we have n many elements and we have not found our element in the middle, we are reducing the space where the interval we are looking at to its half. And we are now using a simple T, which is the time. So if we have N many elements and we have not found the middle element to be the target element, 
I'm just saying, well, I'm looking now into half that into the half, so one half of the interval, left or right many elements. So it's T of N half, but I need a little bit more time on top. And what is often written is like, I need constant time because for these checks and maybe some local variables, comparisons, I need some constant time. And you can write this just as a C because I have constant much time or a one. Just I have um, some constant time and we don't just want to add up C's or fives and threes. We just say one because the exact constant, again, doesn't matter in our O analysis because we say we only care about constants and not the exact constant value. But then it can also happen that we just have one element left and for this element that we have left in our interval, it's either the target we're looking for or not. So we also need constant time to do that check. Because this is the smallest interval possible and we're done. And this is what we're describing with these recurrence relations. And it's important that you put in the first part. So T of N is then T of N half plus something. But also when I ask you in assignments or in the exam to provide recurrence relations, never forget the corner case because we will need this now to solve this. And I want to know, so this recurrence relation simply re describes the running time behavior of our binary search because either we have found this element or we're just looking into half the interval plus in, or in both cases, we need a little bit of constant time, constant work on top. And what I'm doing now is I want to determine the O complexity of that algorithm by solving the recurrence relation. And I'm showing you now how to solve a re recurrence relation. First of all, I just say what I had put in the first line, T of N is T of N half plus one. And I'm now always assuming the worst case. I need to keep halving the interval and really the last element eventually in this one element interval is the one I'm looking at to determine whether it's the target or not. So what I'm doing now is I have this one here, T of N half plus one, and I'm applying the recurrence relation here again. And if I have n half and half it again, then it's n divided by four. Plus, I have constant time again, because whatever n I plug in, I half n plus constant time. And now n half is the n I'm putting in, so I'm getting out, if I half this again, n, four, n divided by four. Plus constant time, plus my old one. So these are just these ones from before. Now we can try this again, that I'm putting in my n divided by four and again, half it again. So it's n divided by eight plus one, plus the red one, plus the black one. Are you okay with this structure? So I keep always plugging in n divided by something into the recurrence relation. I just keep developing this. And if you're okay, thumbs up. If you're not, send your questions. And now I keep doing this it, and I try to find a pattern in the re recurrence relation. And the pattern is actually something like I divide by two, I divide by four, by eight, by 16, by 32. So what I'm doing is I have my N and if I divide this, if I do K many steps, I divide it by two to the K because it's two, then four, then eight, then 16, 32. So I have K many times and I'm writing the K in a different color for now. Just to highlight this and for each time i'm doing this recursion i'm adding another one 
So I have k many ones, so plus k, because I have a one, then a one, then a one, and so forth. So plus k for k many recursive calls. And now all I want is, I want to keep doing this until I'm in the corner case. And the corner case is T of one. So I, I need to know how often do I need to do this? So how large do I need to make K that eventually N divided by two to the K would be one. So what I want to know is when is N divided by two to the K is one because this is the corner case from up here. This is my central question and I need to solve for K. So I can do this now. I can say, well, N is two to the K because I multiply by two to the K. So it disappears from this fraction and it's on the right. And now I want to solve for K so I can take the logarithm So it's log n and it's the log of two to the k. And as you remember, there are logarithm rules that I can move the exponent before the logarithm. So it's log n is k times log two. And now I just divide by log two. So this is log n divided by log two is k. And what I can, so now I have solved the recurrence relation and I can just write this a little bit nicer because I can say the log n divided by log two two is simply the log two of n because this comes from down here. So it's just basic logarithm rules. Now I have found a solution for k and I'm almost done. My goal up here was to find a solution for k and I'm writing this out again because I said before that t of n is T of n divided by two to the k plus k. This is exactly what I had done here before. And I've just written this down there again. So T of n was this. And now I have a solution for k and I'm plugging this solution into the recurrence, into the pattern of the recurrence relation. So I can write, this is T of N two, and I'm now using red for K and K is log two of N. Plus K and here K is again, log two of N. And now I need to simplify all of this a little bit. I can say this whole term here is, I can simplify because I have two to the binary logarithm of two of n. And as you know, they are the inverse functions, the two and the, uh, or two to the something and log two of something, they're just the inverse. And then they just cancel out. So I'm writing here, this is T of n divided by n. So same, you can imagine this, if this is E or LN, they're just the inverse functions, plus log two of N. And I can still simplify this because N divided by N is T of one plus log two of N. Now I've almost solved it. The only question is what is T of one? And this is something we looked at the very beginning. T of one is one. So I can just write this out and I can say, well, this is one plus 
log two of n. And now I have this term. And what's the O complexity of this term? If you know it, send it to the chat. Still uh, waiting for you. And we got the right answer that this term is O of log n because that one is a constant it disappears and then we have this log 2n and log 2 is just a constant with a 2 in the log so it's just o of log n i know this were a lot of steps i'll explain i'll quickly go through with you it uh, to it through it and now we're done so we defined a recurrence relation in order to determine the running time behavior of our binary search. And we had n and then we half n. So we just look at half of the interval plus some constant time. And this is the corner case. And then I'm trying to find a pattern if I apply the recurrence relation to its itself. So I had that my t of n half, which is t of n divided by four, but I always have these ones on top. And I'm trying to find the pattern and put in a variable k and then I want to know when does this end up in the corner case and corner case would be that n divided by two to the k is one, depending on this recurrence relation. If the recurrence relation looks different, say if this was t of zero or t of five, you would put in the zero or five. Zero doesn't work for this recurrence relation, uh, but one, for example, and one is the one we define in the recurrence relation. And then you solve for k, so we said n equals to two to the k, and then I'm just applying the logarithm and k is the binary logarithm of n. And wherever I had a k before in the pattern of the recurrence relation, I'm plugging in the k and eventually I'm simplifying the terms. And, um, and once I have simplified the term, I apply to the term my O complexity. And I see now, that my binary search is O of log n. I have described this also in my slides. So this is just what we did. And uh, we found a pattern, we solved for k, plugged k into the pattern, and we got the O complexity. I know this was quite a tough one, but make sure you revise this until next week that you are okay with find, with solving the recurrence relation for binary search and finding the O complexity of the solution, what we have just done, because next week we will look at more algorithms and try to find their O complexity. Um, more recursive algorithms, we define slightly different recurrence relations and see how we can solve them. And there will be many, many more exercises in here, including, for example, the recurrence relation for the towers of Hanoi. And because solving recurrence relations manually is quite time consuming for a certain kind of pattern of recurrence relations, there is the master theorem, which allows us to solve this far easier, but only for a certain kind of recurrence relation, not for all. So you still need to be comfortable with solving them manually. Uh, that's the focus of next week. Um, if there are no more questions, I wish you a good weekend. And um, also, uh, the coursework is there. Um, but basically, I think you can do all the work of the coursework for recursion now. The recursion chapter covers some function in different ways that you need to implement recursively and more efficiently. So this is something you can already do next week in the lab. But please revise, from all the things you revise, spend most time on how to solve these recurrence relations, at least this first example, so you're okay with the examples next week. I wish you a good weekend. See you next week. Bye-bye. Uh,